Good morning, Doreen Moore, TRS Travel Resort Services Vacation Rentals. Frank Hibbard, Mayor of Clearwater. Good morning, Russ Kimball, Sheraton St. Key, Clearwater Beach. Good morning, Steve Hayes, Visit St. Pete, Clearwater. Good morning, Michael Zoss, County Attorney's Office. Good morning, Ken Welch, Mayor of St. Petersburg. Good morning, Clyde Smith, Billmar Beach Resort, Treasure Island. Uh, Phil Henderson, Starlight Cruises, South Pasadena, Madeira Beach, and Clearwater Beach. Very good, we have a quorum. Um, let's get rolling right into the agenda. Uh, item number three, approval of TDC minutes. Are there adjustments or is there a motion to approve? Motion by Mayor Hibbard, second by Mayor Welch. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed, show it passes unanimously. Do we have any public comments? No public comments. We're gonna uh, move the order of the agenda this morning. We have uh, some folks stuck on the Howard Franklin. So we're gonna move from uh, straight to item number six, capital funding program guideline discussion. Mr. Hayes, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members. Um, so, that time for us to start discussing capital projects is up again. And if you remember in, the, in October, we had the initial discussions um, about some, um, what I would call some administrative changes that Mr. Zoss had gone through after discussion with the group here that he had presented and we represented that again here today. What I'd like to do is start having the discussion on capital projects um, to go through and get your input in different, different areas of this so that as staff, we can come back to you with recommendations of changes to the guidelines where needed um, for additional discussion and then approval. And then from there, open it or uh, once it's approved, pass that on to the BCC for approval, and then we can start the process for the capital guideline uh, project. So again, what I'd like for us to have today is more of a discussion. Um, and again, the document that you have in front of you was the, the blue lines that uh, Mr. Zoss had provided. Um, and then from there, there's some areas that I wanna have further discussion on to get your input um, so that the recommendations that we have come back um, are in target or in line with, 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 what, you're, with what you're thinking. So, um, Mr. Zoss, is there anything in there on the blue line that we want to pay attention to first just for the group as a whole? I don't think so. Let me double check, Steve. I don't think so. I think mostly it was just cleanup, um, nothing really substantive. I think the um, salient points to discuss for this group as far as recommendations would be most of the policy kind of considerations. Okay. All right, if we, if we can, if you'll uh, pull out your document of the program guidelines, just some couple of notes that I've made, again, for conversation's sake to get us moving in the right direction. Um, on page one, of the document for the guidelines. One of the areas, um, and we briefly talked about it, I believe it might have been in October, um, but we currently have a half of a percent available for beach renourishment. Um, and in there, the discussion was, um, do we have enough that's there in case something happens and we don't get funding from, let's say, the Army Corps of Engineers or another entity, and we still need to re-nourish re, uh, the beach, um, do we have enough money in there? Should we look at changing that percentage um, to kind of protect that for the future? Um, I know Jim gave a, a good update on where we were with the res that reserve portion of it, but again, realizing how important the, the beach is to help generating the revenues, which we're able to do so many of these things. The question is, is that something we wanna make a change in the policy or make a recommended change? Um, or is that something you're okay with leaving at the time? I'm gonna just open that up. Mr. Henderson. Um, I was concerned about that when we discussed it, but uh, Jim assured us that we're on track with what we need right now. We could always 
reach into other capital dollars if you know federal matching, state matching um, never started to deteriorate. And we can address it at that point. So, you know, I thought we should be saving more, reserving more, but I think we can, we'll have enough of lead time to be able to adjust that when the time comes. Uh, Mayor Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have a, a what is the reserve amount that's set aside for beach <coughs> nourishment? Do we have an allocation that's set aside and reserved for beach nourishment now? Uh, yes, the, the, I haven't updated it recently, but the, um, the estimated beginning fund balance in FY22 that was set aside in the capital fund, not in the tourist development tax fund, what we transfer out each year, the half percent that, that Steve mentioned, um, was uh, just over $26 million. Um, on, on top of that, uh, we'll be transferring in um, I think it's around six million dollars in the current fiscal year, uh, okay. and then uh, next year we plan to not only do the half percent, but to increase that amount by the difference between what was collected that would have gone to beach nourishment if it was done in real time in FY21 and what was actually transferred. So it's a little under two million dollars additional money that we are transferring from the TDT fund to. Um, I guess to play catch up to FY21. And we'll do that again in 24 based on collections and distributions in 22, if that's what the, what the TDC recommends and the board approves. Um, but we can do that every year. We can look back to the last year of, of transfers and what was collected and make the adjustments at that point. So we don't have to try to uh, make amendments at the end of the, budget amendments at the end of the fiscal year and try to get it in. Um, you know, it, it, it's just easier and cleaner to, to look at what the final numbers are and then make adjustments on the next okay. budget request. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Jim, I love it when you talk numbers. It's good to see you again. Um, so was that 33 million in total, 26 plus yeah. six for FY22 and the 1 million true up? Um, so- Well, no, the- what will be in there at the end of this fiscal year mm -hmm. will be approximately the $32 million. It'll be the, the 26 that, that was in there at the beginning of the year. Well, and if they use some for, for beach projects, I don't know what exactly is scheduled for, okay. for, but that, for use. In terms of what we set aside, it's about $32 million. Yes, it, it'll be okay. a, around that amount by the end of this fiscal year, minus whatever is, is, used, is actually used during this fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. That's total beach, I mean, total capital funds. That's not a beach set aside. No, that's that's beach set aside in the capital fund. Okay, that's what we have in reserves. Yeah. Correct. That, okay. That's, that's the beach specific funds that we that we identify each year. And then the, the capital funds within the tourist development tax fund is much higher. It, it's um, projected to be around 70 million at the end of next year. Uh, that that's after taking out the beach money that we uh, will ask for in the FY23 budget request. So uh, okay. um, right now we're projected to be about $45 million at the end of this fiscal year in capital reserves within the tourist development tax fund. Okay. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna, I'm not making a recommendation that we would change that right now, but we just wanna make sure that in the future we keep in mind the changing climate and the effects it's having on the beach. Um, example of Sunset Beach is deteriorating much quicker uh, than it has in previous uh, cycles, I'll say, of the beach renourishment. So it's gonna be a full year behind on, uh, by the time they get to it in 23 of what's really needed for that community. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the last six months, we had a really good update on what projects they were doing with beach renourishment and where the money was and everything. So I feel pretty comfortable with it. But I do think from a policy perspective, we should probably have that presentation annually so that we stay on top of it and it's in front of our face because that money is never shown on our budget sheet. And I, I, I think it should be, you know, because we, we never seem to know how much is really in there. Um, and we get that nice budget sheet every every month or annually, whatever. I mean, I think it should be a part of that discussion. 
um, because we do focus on certain areas of beach renourishment, but there are a lot of beaches around the county that could probably use something, and I, I think we should be looking at that in the future. But besides that, I think we should get the annual update. Mr. Anderson. Uh, Jim, you mentioned that it'll, you're playing catch up this year and then you'll do it again in 24. So is it every other year or every three years that you would? Uh, no, it would be every, every year and we could do that. Um, well, when I, I, the FY23 budget is the next one that's coming up. So we'll make up, we'll catch up for FY21. And FY24 will catch up based on FY22. And FY25 will catch up based on FY23. Just in case there's something extraordinary that happens. Well, it's not extraordinary. It's just we don't know how much we actually collect until um, December. Right. That's when we get our, our last, or uh, November is when we get our last collection for the previous fiscal year. And the budget is closed by then. We can't make any other changes. Yeah, we, we so that, right? they'll, they'll finalize the numbers. They'll, you know, they'll make sure that uh, everything's collected and we'll know exactly how much money is available. And then when we do the budget in October, uh, in April when it's presented to county administrator and then in June or July when we present it to the board, we'll know exactly how much money is available, right. extra money is available from the last previous full fiscal year. Right. We discussed last time about you know, amending that amount during the year, but that requires a budget amendment. You said it's a lot more difficult. Correct. So it, this it, is it requires it, budget around to do the same thing. Correct. It, it requires budget amendments, and it requires um, better forecasting than I'm avail than I'm able to do. And uh, if things slow down um, later in the year, later in the year, then we would have to make another uh, right. adjustment. So we'll just we'll do it cleanly with a complete set of books, complete set of collections. And, um, you know, it, it, it makes it, you know, you guys will hear everything and it'll just be part of your process. Great, perfect, thank you. Mr. Prather. Good morning, thank you, Chair. Um, we left a discussion six, nine months ago about the difficulties that you at the county level were having. We've always had the same model, property owners on the beaches own to the mean high tide line. For the Army Corps to go, onto those properties and renourish the beaches as they've done for years. Now there's a new policy. They want easements retroactively um, for every property owner, which is virtually impossible to have. Do you see any changing in that? Is, is there any update on that? There's no formal update. Um, I met with Congressman Christ and uh, someone from the Army Corps um, and funding uh, folks in Washington and they understand our predicament and they understand uh, our concerns and they're looking at it is where we're at right now. Thank you know, you. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was just probably um, early February. Um, and this was some of the new staff in Washington that, you know, um, and, and they were very welcoming to our discussion, but you know, whether or not they'll give us that, that flexibility, I don't know. All right. So that was that was good feedback. So I uh, appreciate um, that. Uh, moving on in the guidelines, I'm going to go to page. Uh, page six, and this gets into the funding um, standards. And much like we did with the lead events. Um, and looking at the um, measurables against the different funding levels. Um, I forget who brought it up from this council, but um, you know, an elite event had the same room night capability as if you had a, a, new, a new venue, a facility, or a new project. So um, on this one, um, just any feedback you would have on any other measurables you'd wanna see I think what staff can do is come back and look at this and try to be more realistic in what that number is. And I think the one change that was done, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, in this one we go through and we and we go through and we look at the the room nights right now, um, and that is on an and that's an, annual basis, not over the life of the. 
that was something that we were still discussing as to if it was going to be an initial annual increase or if it's supposed to keep building, which seemed kind of impossible. Yeah. So that's still a point of, but I think the numbers is what you were trying yeah. to get some direction from the TDC as far as if they thought those numbers were still reasonable. Mr. Henderson. Um, I think it should demonstrate an increase and then maintain that increase. I can't see them increasing it by that much every every single year, but each year over year, once the increase is made, because as a result, it should be recurring or should demonstrate the ability to, to be recurring. Um, along that same subject, back on page five, I noticed G, you know, applicants shall provide future marketing and or sponsorship benefits uh, equal to the contribution, funding contribution of the county. So you're saying in that it's had to, I read that to be, if you get $5 million, then we should get $5 million in marketing and, and sponsorship back. And if I, if I may, I remember that conversation that came up during one of the cycles where there was funding awarded and there was a little bit of confusion as to whether or not the um, guidelines as written intended that it be a dollar for dollar. If we're giving you $5 million, we're getting $5 million in return and value. Um, or if it was more flexible for the BCC to make that determination based on a, on a recommendation. That's why this is now saying or giving the alternative either dollar for dollar or the flexibility. So, which could still be the same dollar for dollar. The BCC, you guys could recommend and the BCC could agree that, yeah, we're given, say, $30 million and we're going to have marketing deliverables over a period of 20 years. So, one and a half million dollars, if the, my math is correct, is a fair amount of, uh, of return for that. So, so, that's just to build in a little bit more flexibility. I see there's a note about whether it should be an amount to be determined by the BCC or if it should be just flat equal to. That's yeah, that's what I mean. It's either, and you guys can recommend, you can leave it as is, you don't have to make any of these changes, or you could say, yeah, let's make that change so that the BCC's got the flexibility to determine, and you guys can, uh, as the TDC, make a recommendation when it goes forward, because all of this would go through the TDC first for a recommendation for funding uh, and some of the terms, and then obviously the BCC would ultimately evaluate that. I just, my point is it seems a little steep to provide that plus room nights plus visitors. That's a policy call. That Yeah, that's a policy call as well as to whether all of those, that's something you guys could discuss and make a recommendation to the BCC to uh, so my, modify. The point would be when you're looking at ways to adjust those numbers on page six, you may want to also look at that paragraph G uh, for a total um, expected return from the applicant. Great feedback, Mr. Henderson. Any other comments on the section uh, that Mr. Henderson brought up or the, the funding standards? So then the group as a whole is fine with us coming back with the recommendation and the rationale behind, behind what that ends up being? Yes. Okay. All right. And, and Phil, I like, I like how you said the total ROI. So maybe building it. So here's what the total ROI is, but it's made up of these things. Mike. Fill your mic's off. Apologize. Um, yeah, my point was it just seems, believe it or not, I'm saying it's a little, it'll, it's a little much to ask all that and all this combined, you know, to get a net net, you know, more than 100% back. Um, but they should be doing some marketing and some sponsorship for us as well as pro producing room nights and, and attendees. But I'll let the staff figure out what that mix should be. Okay, great, thank you. All right, anything else on that part? 
All right, if we move to page. Steve, I'm sorry, if, oh, if I'm I might. Sorry. There was a question, I think I addressed it with Mayor Bajowski, as to uh, under funding standards under three, there had been an issue uh, as to whether we wanted to continue um, carving out that exception for uh, Major League Soccer. That's a policy call again, so that's just something, I don't know if, if you guys want to leave it as is or if you want that provision um, struck from the guidelines. It's on uh, funding, section on page six, funding um, A3. And it's, and, and, and all it really does, frankly, is kind of formalize the fact that the board could always waive it anyway, and it was just kind of a built-in waiver, so you didn't have to ask the board to waive that for Major League Soccer. And that was something that the TDC at that time um, thought was important to include in the guidelines. It's a different TDC now. I know the mayor brought it up. That's why we're just saying, hey, give us some direction as to whether or not you want to leave that in or not. So, I'd like to see it left in. I think the intent is still to watch how that go develops over the next so many years uh, and where it goes. It could be great and uh, for the area, and it's the right time of the year before the main season. Uh, but we just don't know right now. So. I think, I, I think the same thing. Mr. Henderson? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's feasible to see a spring training actually increase, but actually the intent would be to maintain what they're doing as opposed to adding a whole lot to it. So I would see where that would be something that would be exempt or carved out. Um, probably waived every time a spring training facility came in and asked for dollars. <laughs> so I think we probably should leave it in. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair. Mayor. I just thought I'd let you guys know that we did have a St. Louis Major League Soccer team in our city last month um, doing spring training. Um, the head coach grew up in Dunedin and he brought his team down, didn't ask us for a thing. Nice. It was wonderful. If, if I might, and Mayor, thanks for uh, mentioning that. We also had in the union, we're back. Um, I also believe Cincinnati was here. I could be wrong on that, but am I right, am I right on that, Mayor? Yes, they were scrimmaging with the union. Okay. And I also understand that there was a couple other teams in the Bay Area, um, if you, especially if you go down into Bradenton area. So obviously, um, Major League Soccer felt that this wonderful area was a great place to get their legs going for the, the new uh, season. So it's good to hear that St. Louis was here. I got to correct myself. I thought it was major, major League Baseball. I see the S there now for soccer. It's a totally different animal, I guess. So I'm going to retract what I said, and you guys decide what you want to do. The, the comment is that uh, I like it be, uh, because it falls in February. And they're gone before spring training for baseball. And February is one of those months that kind of ramping up, but it's not there completely, and you need that type of business. So I think it's the timing is good. MLB, MLS, they're all, they're all the same. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Um, next page then would be on page eight. And this is under the evaluation process. So one of the things that I'd like to throw out for discussion is um, looking at the evaluation process and do we try to replicate what we are now going to be doing with elite events, where with staff working with a consultant, and we do have a consultant for the capital projects, um, uh, Crossroads Consulting, um, based out of St. Petersburg, is the one who will be handling this. Um, but working with them is to review all the applications um, to ensure accuracy, all the information is there, and then for staff and the consultant to come back with a recommendation and discussion before this body. Um, and, then, and then have this body then um, vote on, on those and move that up to the, the BCC. 
that would be a departure of what was done in the past, uh, where you guys were actually doing doing the scoring and what have you. But so I wanted to throw that out there because I haven't been through this before. So I wanted to make sure I was in line uh, with the thought and then and then get some feedback. Mayor, I think it's a great idea because I do think it. Sometimes it, the process becomes a little political. We've seen that in the past and and. Um, I think having the experts, if you will, review the application, um, folks that have expertise in the in the tourism field that can see benefits that maybe layman folks can't see, um, and we ultimately still get to see it and see your thoughts and have the dialogue based on the experts reviewing it, but I, I do think it's probably a good thing. Mr. Henderson. I agree. I echo that. And, and uh, we're definitely, they're more qualified than we are to review these things. But the presentation should include um, some pretty good detail on how they got to where their recommendation is um, going through the guidelines uh, that are presented here. But they're definitely going to be more qualified than the random members here. So I would support that. Mr. Prather. When we typically have had the group presentations, whether it's an elite event or a capital project, and the, the asking party gives up and gives their pitch, and then we hopefully have done our homework in advance, and we listen to the pitch, and then, and then we score. <clears throat> in this case, I'm with Mayor Majowski. I love the idea of you, Steve, and your team spending t further time to vet each one of those in advance, you giving your or your staff's recommendation. My question is, are you also then going to have a follow-up behind your at the podium um, interpretation of the pitch then to have the applicant also come behind you and do the typical what we always have had is give their pitch after yours or before yours? Is it both? Um, ideally, I think you would have the applicants there. And then as we review everything, if there are questions of the TDC members, that the applicant is there to help answer that beyond what staff can do. Um, if you feel a desire to have a presentation before recommendations, we can do that. But you know, again, I have not been through this pro this type of process before, so you know, I'm not sure how in depth you're going to want the information. But again, if staff's doing their job, we're reviewing everything in that, that application and can provide the recommendations based on that. The only thing you would have is if there's questions we couldn't answer, having the applicant there to answer that. And of course, the, the follow-up to that is, if they don't agree with your recommendation, there's got to be an example that would come up where you're not going to recommend what they're asking, their full amount or not at all. Do they have a chance for rebuttal? And those meetings are long enough, I get it. We'll sit there almost all day sometimes in those to add a whole nother layer of presentations. Not that we can't spend another several hours in that room uh, once, twice a year, but um, once again, I just want the people to be heard if they don't necessarily agree with your recommendation. I, I just, transparency. And, and if I may, just to clarify a few things, the way the um, guidelines have uh, been drafted uh, con pretty consistently, because they have been revised several times, there was never an intent for a full presentation because we thought that would be turn into too much of a, uh, a almost unfair to some of the smaller applicants because you'd have much showier presentations and what have you. So it's basically the applicants are there. It's a public meeting, and they're there to answer questions if questions come up of whoever's reviewing it. That'll still continue. And to answer the final question, I think, Mr. Prather, yes. In the event that they was a funding recommendation or a denial or less a funding at a smaller amount, that applicant can always go to the public meeting at the BCC and try to get the BCC to also reconsider uh, the recommendation. Obviously, staff would give their rationale, and then the BCC would ultimately make the decision. So there is there is opportunities for um, them to kind of get their case of, across as to why they want the funding amount. Thank you both, Mayor Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree of uh, moving it to a staff review process as much as 
of a character building exercise it is for the chair to navigate that process. I hate to deprive you of that. You said you've never seen it before, Steve. It's something to see. Uh, so I, I think this is a great, a great move. So I, I thought that. you were going to make a motion to just give the chair the authority. I thought that was, you know, you don't need to say that, at least this year. Mr. Henderson. Um, as part of the process, I would like to see whatever the uh, recommendations are ahead of a meeting. I don't want to sit in one meeting and have to absorb it all and, and, and understand it all and, and know what kind of questions to ask. Uh, so I would, you know, I would think that whatever presentation is going to be get, given um, and the recommendations following that should be given to us in advance of a meeting so we have a, 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 an idea and a flavor of what's going to be presented to us and be ready with questions or concerns or have the ability to, to be ready. I think very fair. Mr. Kimball. I agree. I think it improves the, the process uh, completely. And I think in light of the other, pro other projects we have on the other side, major events, it puts it the same for both of them. And I think it cleans it up uh, a lot and gives us more knowledge uh, before we do uh, agree. And I, I, I like the idea. All right, that's, uh, thank you for that um, support. The, the other item, and, it, and, I, and I just want to make sure that we're looking at things correctly, and I know there was a little bit of discussion re regarding the rating criteria. So I know as staff and the consultant, we would look at each project and then look, does it meet certain uh, standards? Is there certain um, impacts? you know, positive impacts to the community and the industry and what have you. So the, right now there are, are five things that are, are listed. One of the things that I, I'm going to add to this, and this will, this will come out of strategic plan, is does it meet a strategic priority? Because I think that's going to be um, um, important. The other thing, and this was item, so on page uh, nine and item E, the extent the capital projects achieves geographic distribution, and again, points that were related to that. I think I understand the reasoning behind that, but if I could get some clarification, you know, how, how important is that to this group, or do we just take that into consideration overall um, when we look at not only applicants, but the types of projects. Mayor Brzezowski. I was just going to say that I, I think the reason that it was there is because there were a lot of projects that were sort of lumped in one area of the county, and it was a sort of a reminder to say we want to try and make sure we spread things around the county. That was why it was there. I'm not going to opine on the importance of it. I mean, I do think that should get consideration but if it's a good project you don't want to say no just because it's in the you know wrong side of the county or whatever um, but I, I think that's why it was there there is no wrong side of the county mr. Henderson Correct. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was we were trying to figure out a way to come up with some way to make sure these projects are dispersed across the county not all lumped into okay. north south whatever but I don't so, know how to, you know I don't know how the, like it says if it's a good project it's a good project so was it the it, was it just to like if the last three years we funded all North County we want to balance it off the South County they get a bonus hundred points, or is it? I mean, because obviously you have a project that's not going to benefit countywide necessarily, the same level. Right, and it's you know a lot of a lot of the twenty four cities in Pinellas County are very small with like five thousand ten thousand residents and they don't get as many opportunities to have a project that is tourist driven. So when they do, they get, you know, they should get the extra 100 points because of that, because it's in some, an area that might not normally be served by this particular organization or funding source. Okay, and Bill? It's kind of a tiebreaker. You know, if you've got more requests and you have funds, well, you lean to the ones that are gonna be spread out as opposed to awarding the ones that are all lumped together. Or if we've concentrated on one area, we've awarded quite a bit in one area, then it's time to move it to a different part of the county, possibly. But it's a tough one to 
to do. The intent's there, but hard to put in a measurable or a Mayor? guideline. And so uh, following up on Mayor Bojowski's point, it's not necessarily geography. It's more an issue of an equitable distribution uh, for some of the smaller communities. Um, and so I think that is, to me, it's a balancer um, to make sure that, you know, countywide, everyone's getting a, a fair shot. Um, one of the things, which was my original point, so I've lost my original point, Mayor, um, I did want to ask how we, uh, and I know we're not um, looking at a specific project, but how does something like the Woodson that we talked about last month figure into this? Um, it might not meet the criteria as we've laid it out because it's a brand new project. So would that <laughs> category apply to something like that? Um, just trying to understand how we're going to approach that kind of a project. <laughs> Again, on the from the application standpoint, is to look at the project itself, what they are looking at accomplishing, and you know, having met with them, mm -hmm. and then even seeing their presentation. I mean, I I feel it would qualify, just because of the the types of folks that would be coming in to visit. The question is, is what. But, what does that end up being at, at the end? And we won't know that until we start getting the applications. So we're okay with projections. They don't have a track record of attendance, so we're okay with projections. Um, I, I, I think so, because okay. at the end, there, someone's going to come back and say, we project that by doing this, we're going to get X amount of visitors. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the um, Museum of the American Arts and Crafts is a good example. Yep. It didn't exist, and now it's world class. And, and that received funding. It did. And that, again, <laughs> was an example of why this process needs to go to staff, because that's the example I was thinking about. Because it received funding, but when it got to the commission, there was a whole debate there about whether it should, should receive funding. So um, the other just um, thing I wanted to highlight is there was a push not too long ago to carve out a um, portion of the bed tax just for South County and St. Petersburg. And when we looked at, and I didn't support that, and when we looked at where the funding had actually gone, you know, South County had actually received more than, than its uh, fair share. And so we do need to keep that in mind going forward because that's what folks are thinking about. And of course, Tropicana Field is the biggest piece of that going forward. But that, I think we still need to address that issue. So maybe not, if it's not geographical, it's just an equitable distribution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Hibbard. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always get a little worried when we get too prescriptive, and yet at the same time, this language to me is somewhat ambiguous because I don't know how we measure it or what the standard really is. Um, we can look at where more funding has gone. Also, I think we ought to look at where more funding is generated. Um, I'm a little biased that way, seeing as we're the largest funder of any of the cities. But, you know, I, I think it's a guideline. I don't think it's uh, as easy to measure as we would think. And we certainly haven't put what too much funding in one area versus another is. So, you know. What Phil believes is too much one area, I might not believe it's enough. It's, that worries me a little bit. I like having a standard that we could look at. Um, that's one issue there. I fully support having staff vet these first because hopefully you are more objective. We all know that sometimes when it gets to us, uh, it becomes a little bit more political and sometimes more parochial. And so for the first filter, I think staff needs to be a large part of it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. The last question did come back to me. Um, where are our strategic priorities documented? They are being 
drafted at this time. Okay. Um, and actually, um, that was going to be in, in, in my report just as a, a, an update. But okay. um, we have a presentation to the BCC for a workshop on April 21st, I believe. It's a Thursday. So it's the day after our TDC meeting. Um, and I was going to let you all know that that date so that you could also attend because we're going to have HCP give a, an update of where they're at um, mm -hmm. based on the conversations they've had with leaders throughout the community, through the online surveys, through all of these different things. So um, okay. again, that's where that update will be. And then from there, we can go through and say, here's some key priorities that you know everyone has as a group has set our priority for the county and moving forward. Now, how does that fit into, is it a capital program or a marketing program? Th you know, things along that line. Thank you. Uh, it is at 9 a.m. I just don't know where we are on, on that, that agenda. The, the last thing I just wanted to, to bring up, and again, um, so you know, let's say in this process we go through and we get 20 applicants that all have projects, uh, but we only have funding to take care of nine of them, is one of the things I'd like to look at, and I, and I don't know if this is in a guideline, but more maybe of a just a direction from, from the TDC itself that we could then make the recommendation, is you take the projects, the 11 that were not on there, and it doesn't mean they're not, they're, that they're not good projects, it means there wasn't enough funding to take care of those, is that we still keep a list going. That we have a, you know, and so that at the end, as a project comes on board, you put it into the, to, to the list, and then, we can always evaluate, you know, utilizing the consultant and staff, other projects that happen to come forward at different times. It's it, it's a way because it's a way to keep ourselves you know reminded of what is out there that can be done. And in the years that we're lucky and and we're, and great things are happening and we have excess funds, then other things get funded. Um, if we're you know in a time period where you know. Uh, we don't have as much funding like we did with the pandemic, then you know what? It, you know, we're not able to fund as much. So it's just, there's this list that's there. And I think we need to keep ourselves aware of that because again, I think if someone's taking the time and effort to apply, they think that project is worthwhile. And we will know based on the conversations we have with them and as well as the consultant and, and our expertise. So. Have, have you guys ever considered that before? Do you think that's a good thing to do? Um, or, you know, just some thoughts. And again, I'm just kind of throwing out there. I doubt that this is a policy um, or, or a guideline, but it's just more of a philosophy. Mr. Anderson. Um, I'm curious as to what kind of cycle we're on. I know we, at one point, we said we're going to do it every other year because. It was, didn't make sense to do it every year. And we were committing funds out for three or four years, and there wasn't anything to, to award because it's already all committed based on our anticipated future revenues. So I'm not sure where we are right now with that. Are we still every other year, or is it every third year, or is it any of the above? Well, thanks to pandemic, that threw that through a loop. Um, and so we were supposed to be doing this process in 21. Is that right, Jim? Is it 21? I don't remember. It, uh, 21 sounds possible. Yeah, because yeah. um, uh, it would have been 20 was when pandemic started and we halted it because we didn't think the revenues were going to be coming in. So now, and again, uh, listening to Michael, these are just our guidelines. There's nothing that's set that we have to do it every two years. We could do it every three years. You know, if we're if we're you know have great uh, seasons and the revenues are there, there may be more if we wait three years than if we did two. I think we just make that discussion ourselves. 
um, and as a group, and then we can set the dates and times after um, getting approval from the BCC. Just one point of clarification, as currently drafted, and this has been consistent, it's supposed to be every two years. Okay. Obviously, we can waive that as a result, like in the pandemic, um, but that does not preclude, for example, the Florida Holocaust Museum came forward and it was during an off cycle, if you will, and asked, and obviously, as long as it meets the statutory criteria and the TDC recommends it, you can always um, review the project and determine eligibility. So you're not tied into it necessarily that schedule. Okay. Mr. Kimball. Um, just to clarify, I think as we went through this time period, uh, <clears throat> after uh, baseball uh, bond was paid off and everything, we went to no bonding and, and the philosophy that we're going to pay for it as we go along. But we also schedule wise to do some of these, Steve, we spread out the payments to, I believe Dolly was one of those or a couple of them over a three year period that they wouldn't need the money until this period of time. And I think that's how we were able to do a few projects that we wanted to do, um, but then necessarily have the money that day. And I think that's how we have accomplished some great things in the last few years over this without as much money uh, on it. That's true. Or we did that with the need something. Yeah, we had the, the uh, we had paid off the trop and we had added the sixth cent and then we didn't spend any money for a year. So after that was over, we had a, a, a good bankroll that we were able to fund a lot of these big projects in a two or three year period of time, uh, including Dunedin, Ruth Ecker, the aquarium, those kind of things. So we're a, li we're a little bit playing catch up because we hadn't been able to do anything. We had some great projects that had come along and then we were fortunate enough, a couple of them came over three years, got it delayed a year and then went from there. I think Phillies is one of those. That was like that also, that commitment. Mr. Henderson. Um, there was a former board member that wanted to see a uh, project spread out over 15 and 20 years. And uh, I think most of us were against that. And what we ended up doing was, was taking on big projects and trying to pay them as quick as we can <clears throat> so we're not committed 10 years down the road not knowing what's going to actually happen. And once we lock into that, we've got to pay that and that might I mean we have to sacrifice some some marketing dollars so moving forward i think we should continue that track and just take these projects and try and pay them in the near term as much as possible so we don't have that obligation hanging over us for years to come and then we can see exactly what we have a couple of years from now we say okay we can forecast that we need this much for those and we have this much excess we can anticipate this much coming in so we can open the process again but i would be in favor of trying to pay things off as quick as possible or you know over a two or three year time frame so that we're not obligated 10 years down the road to something that may not fit at, the, at that time. Yeah, we had, we had so much, quite frankly, we had so much money stockpiled in that short period of time. Um, we also wanted to pay them down in those two or three year periods so that, and this we're talking back in 16, 17, that when it got to like 19 or 20, if there was a decision to be made on the raise, we would have that flexibility if we wanted to go that way. We're still sitting here in 22 without having to make that decision, Mayor, but um, uh, maybe someday we'll make that decision. Mayor, did you have something? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Mr. Henderson on that. You know, when we fund a project quickly, we can actually fund it with less money because the present value. Whereas if we stretch it over many years, it's a much larger dollar amount because whomever is doing it is then having to finance the project. So if the money is there, I think it should be done in shorter periods of time. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my only concern of this part of the discussion is the words for foregoing marketing dollars, that if we overextended ourselves, we just, we, we don't want this to bleed over into the 60%. I think it's very important. Maybe we keep a, a certain amount as contingency in case we do have an off year or years for some reason. Yeah, we, we won't bleed over into that. I, I think there's a whole room full of people to make sure we won't do that. Yeah. Anyone else? The only, the only thought I had on the, I mean, I think it's good to be aware of the projects that are hanging out there that always helps form our discussion. The only thing I wouldn't want is get is all right, you have seven projects, we funded five. 
the, I don't want a presumption of those two projects that the next time we fund that they're first in order, that they've exactly. got to go through the evaluation process just like any other current new project that comes along. That's the only, I don't want a presumption of, well, we got, we were finished last, but we're first next time, uh, you know, no, nope, yeah. starts all over. Anyone else? Data points. What What is our current revenue per penny annually? Is it still in the $9 million range? No? No. Give me one minute. Um. And the second question while you're looking that up is, do we have a schedule of the capital fund and the projects and their status like the Dolly? You know, we've allocated money, but they haven't moved forward. Do we have a we don't have like any, that? We don't have any commitments because we don't have any agreements with either the Dolly or the Phillies mm -hmm. or anybody else. There, there's no, there's, there are negotiations, I believe, that have been going on. <laughs> and Steve and Michael can correct me on that, but I, know, I don't know where they stand, but they've both asked and maybe others have asked as well for funding. And there's been, a, I guess, an agreement in principle by the BCC to move forward with negotiations, but there has been Do no we have a schedule that shows the funds, whether they've been allocated or not? Yeah, that, nothing is allocated. The, the, only, the only project that we have in the capital at this point is the, our annual commitment to beach nourishment and we have $350,000 in the current year budget for the Florida Holocaust Museum, which will probably not be spent this year, so we'll roll it over to next year. But there are no other commitments uh, so what's to the fund. fund. So what's the fund balance, capital fund balance? Uh, the fund balance Jim is, has a great uh, PDF chart that he sends us out that yeah, maybe and, and that I think will that's be, what I need. Yeah, that will be updated. Um, we're, we're in the process of, of doing the budget evaluations for, uh, for all the departments, and we will have that by the next uh, meeting, which will be the budget meeting. So we'll have that available for you at that point. But it's, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, it was, um, it will be approximately $49.5 million at the end of this fiscal year. And we're looking at probably around $70 million at the end of next fiscal year uh, to be in the reserves. Now that that's assuming that we don't add any projects to the to their budget at this point, but the only capital funds we have uh, going out are uh, Beach Nourishment and Florida Holocaust Museum. And the Dolly, Dolly allocation, and if the Phillies come to an agreement, would come out of that 70 million? Correct, okay. that, that would have to fit into that total okay. and any other project um, at you. that point as well. So uh, that's the pool of money for, for, you know, and there's also the St. Pete Historical Society I believe have uh, asked for money as well, but there hasn't been an agreement. Um, the History so, Museum? Um, yeah. I believe it's two, yeah. about just under $3 million yeah. is what was orig originally asked for a couple years ago. It, the agreement has not been in place. So we have it identified as a potential future project. It's just not, it's below the line. It's not above the line. Okay. Well, when you send your schedule, I think that'll answer yeah. my question. There was, Thank you. There was significant, um, uh, uh, adjustments to the original plan of both the history and the Dolly that is causing some of this. I believe at the Phillies as well. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Mayor? Uh, excuse me, but the, the total uh, per percent is, um, we're estimating about $14.3 million in this, this current year. How much did you say? Fourteen point three per percent, and and I'm that's probably a conservative figure, um, and we'll have a better idea again when we uh, when the budget discussion happens next week. I, I was just going to say, and I I, I do kind of understand why Steve's asking the question about um, understanding what projects are coming. I think the smaller ones, none of us really worry too much about. I mean, the two big questions, and no pressure on the two mayors that are here, are the Rays and the Phillies. And and I think it would might be helpful, and you may not be able to do that today, which I understand. But I think it would be helpful for us to have an update on what's happening with that, because I think when you're when you're looking at these things, if if we all agree that you're going to be, you and your staff are going to be the evaluators, right? Initially. Um, and I know these things are going to go to the county first and all of that stuff. Um, 
but it, I mean, those two can eat up all our money for a long time. So it would be, I think it's important for us to at least have that dialogue and understand where they are in the process and, and be aware of it. Other smaller ones I don't think are problematic, but these two, I mean, if the race day, that's gonna be a number, big number, you know? And we all know that. So I, I just think it would be good to understand it, where we are in the process with it. If there is an understanding, <laughs> I don't know. Mayor Hebrew? He's gonna solve the problem right now. Well, no, <laughs> all I can tell you is we are continuing to have dialogue with the Phillies literally on a weekly basis. Uh, they have had some fairly significant changes in their management, uh, which has uh, caused a new viewpoint on some of the things that they want to get accomplished. Uh, we're celebrating their 75th anniversary in Clearwater this year. Nice. I have every intention that we will someday celebrate 100. Uh, they understand what their obligation is going to be, and I think there are some exciting developments that are coming uh, that I can't go into further, but I think it'll be pleasing to everybody. Okay. Mayor? Just as a quick update, um, I have met with uh, Chairman Justice and Barry, um, and the plan is to come to the TDC and the County Commission and the City Council when we get to that point. Um, of course. We're basically just trying to reestablish uh, the relationships and it's going really well Good. Um, between the entities uh, when we talk we can't talk TDC we're talking broader issues as it relates to st. Pete and the county working together but sure. we do plan to come together and talk to the TDC and the Commission you know since I have the mic I'll tell you something kind of interesting when we were doing the negotiations with the Blue Jays you know five years of that I mean these things go on forever mm -hmm. um, one of the things we had said to them was that, you know, we didn't want them to try to create that dorm on their property kind of thing. Right. Because we wanted, it was important to get bed tax dollars and, and, and have them out in the community, you know, like their minor league players, because they, at the time, had seven teams. I don't, I don't think they have that many now. But um, so they are building at their own cost at, their, at, at all the full development rights um, on Dunedin Causeway, their, their own Jays Hotel for their minor leagues, 100 and, I don't remember how many rooms. Um, it's gonna be a full service facility that they are paying bed tax on and it will be used for short term rentals for the small amount of time they won't be there. So I thought that was a really interesting way that they went about it and we have, costing the taxpayer no money and it's going to actually contribute to not you know not only the bed tax but but property tax so, so. hundred and i i don't remember i'm how, sorry i just how's it coming along as far as timing when, when will it be open uh hopefully by next minor league season so that would be the end of next year training yeah, because it's it's for the minor leagues. It's not for the major leagues. Sure. But they do so many hotel rooms um, anyway. I mean, they, they would be contributing through hotel room bed tax anyway. But this way, they're all in one place. It's it's a lot less sure. know, travel. and. It's a neat concept. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. All right, that was great uh, feedback. The, the last thing I wanted to bring up, um, and again, when we look at, you know, the capital projects um, or the capital program, there, you know, the, it pretty much mirrors what is in the tourist development plan. And I, and I know everyone's familiar with that item. Um, and I, I know that when you look, compare our plan to the state statute, um, there is at least one item major item that is allowable now in the statute what is what is not allowed in our tourist development plan and that gets down to i think some infrastructure issues michael if you wouldn't mind just touch on that briefly uh yes sure um it's the addition a few years back 
um, specifically that Steve's referencing. There's also an addition as to um, estuary and lagoons and some other bodies of water that is not in our plan, but specifically he's referencing the public facilities, um, which can include sanitary, sewer, I believe solid waste, transportation and pedestrian facilities. That is a uh, fairly recent addition to the statute about four or five years ago. It was discussed at the time that the joint BCC and TDC did not want to amend the plan to include the possibility, which would be the first step, because um, it is statutorily allowed. So I think that's what Steve is talking about, whether or not this body wants to have that dialogue and make a recommendation to the BCC, whether they want to reconsider amending the plan, which would be the BCC's decision to allow for that. That would be paid out of capital as well. And, and add a little bit of context to that. I was in a, a meeting here uh, recently, and I know it's come up from some of the commissioners uh, related to the tourist development plan and the potential of having it, discussions with this body um, on certain things related to not necessarily the, the marketing side of it, but you know, it, as Michael alluded, the, the infrastructure um, item. Um, so it, again, I think what would be, I, I would love to get feedback from this group is, you know, appetite for having that discussion, learning more, and then direction going forward from here. Mr. Henderson. Uh, aside from the Phillies, do we have any other looming requests for capital? <clears throat> is there any discussion with any other entities right now? Dolly. Well, the Dolly is hanging out there. The St. Pete History Museum is hanging out there. Uh, the Woodson Museum will be coming, obviously. Uh, the Rays. Um, the mayor and I have a bet on that, but the Rays is a potential uh, request out there. Um, anybody? I think that covers it, that I'm aware of. So like for, for Phillies, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> I thought he mentioned the Phillies. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, it seems like a pretty full plate, so I would not be in favor of opening up any more categories, especially infrastructure that probably should be taken care of at the city level. Well, the, the question is, um, the question is, you know, I don't think just from my conversations on the commission, we, we did get into a, a little uh, good discussion at one of our recent meetings about it. There was not necessarily an interest in having TDC money, TDT money pay for like paving this part of the causeway, doing something like that. But if it could help fund a transportation enhancement or a transit enhancement that would directly impact tourists, then there was a different conversation to be had. Um, that was where the conversation was going at our last commission meeting. Well, I would agree to that if we could parse out certain pieces of that. Right. That's, that's where, I mean, that's, you know, that's where I sense the commission going. I don't sense we're going to divert it. But... On the other hand, you know, um, if you, those projects that we all mentioned, except for the raise, could be fully funded with what we have in reserves and be done, and then next year we start again. And so um, the question is, uh, other counties around the state have said we need to have use some of that money for the impact of tourism on our infrastructure, on our things. Uh, in the north, in the Panhandle, they use it for law enforcement, public respond, uh, uh, law enforcement, and, and first responders. So. It's just a discussion that's going to be had, and especially after, especially if um, we we continue to have these kind of numbers, and especially if we get if we get a definitive no from the raise, then that that frees up a big chunk of this conversation. So anyway, that's where it's been going, Mayor. I think it's worth having the dialogue. You're not looking for an answer today, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think having the dialogue on what that might look like. I, I totally understand what Phil's saying. I wouldn't agree with doing sanitary sewer either. Um, I don't think that's the purpose. But I think, I think the mission of our organization um, can, as the law allows, support transit support systems, systems that that are primarily used by tourism or affected by tourism or whatever. And how that's defined, I, I think you know, is a much broader conversation that we can have today. But having the option, it doesn't mean you're going to do it. And certainly, knowing everybody in this room and knowing our BCC, it's going to be heavily scrutinized as to does it really serve tourism in the, the way the law allows. But I think having the dialogue 
well, and understanding what, you know, what could it be and what kinds of things we might want to see in the future is certainly worth having. And the, the kind of the direction that this board gives staff will also be helpful as far as, um, you know, how our, our staff looks at the statutes and, and, uh, and delves into the, the outer ranges of that statute. Well, Michael knows how I feel about it. <laughs> um, I absolutely think that uh, capital means, you know, trolleys and boats and things like that. So I know you guys are looking into it again. I, I've seen that, that. And that's where it's centered on. Yeah. We, it came up when we were talking about uh, Water, a, a more robust ferry system yep. on the intercoastal. Um, that's, that's really where this conversation, it was obviously there's always talk about airport to beach. Um, right. Transportation, transportation, those kind of things. Yep. Since uh, Mr. Zoss mentioned it, uh, what about the other part that has always been in statute that we've never done, the lagoon and estuary improvement? Um, there was some thought last year by some commissioners about uh, at least looking at that as far as um, some county or public owned parks for like Fort DeSoto, not every small neighborhood park, but a major park like Fort DeSoto, which has significant uh, estuary enhancements that we've used um, grants and we've used penny money over the years for. If there's any appetite for that discussion. I would think you just add it all in and have that dialogue. Doesn't mean we're gonna move forward with it. Mayor but, Welch? But why not? I'd agree. I, I think we need a business case for any of these and see what the nexus is with tourism. I mean, we're doing nourishment in Fort DeSoto, right? Or, I guess theoretically we would. I don't know that we have, but yeah. So I don't see the real difference, but that's coming out of the forty percent, right? We're still talking. Yeah. All this is out of the sixty percent is yeah, sacrosanct. So um, yeah, for any of these, let's see the business case and talk about it. All right, you have enough direction. Yes, sir, I do. So uh, again, thank you for the the feedback overall on guidelines. Again, I enjoy the conversation because it gives me an idea of direction, then we can pull things together and then come back to you. Yes, sir. Steve, one final point on the guidelines that I think we missed, uh, just to get some clarification and direction from the TDC. The issue is to reimbursement, whether the payment's gonna continue to be on a reimbursement basis. When, the C when these guidelines were initially drafted, if I recall correctly, the, um, it um, was silent as far as how we paid for these projects and then we switched the mode instead of going bond financing we were kind of paying as you go and so the it got a little chaotic as far as meeting the um keeping track of those payments as they were as the contractors were submitting bills you had multiple projects going on it was a big drain on staff and resources so the bcc decided and i think the tdc concurred at that point to go to a no we'll reimburse you at the end of the project once it's completed one lump sum um, and so there's been some applicants who recognize that while this is basically free money to them, they also want to be able to get paid as they're constructing and want it in phases. So one of the recommendations that we need, or at least a suggestion would be, do you want to build in this, the flexibility to allow the BCC ultimately to decide, nope, it's going to be on at the very end, or we're going to allow phased payments throughout the process because right now it's on a reimbursement basis. I think you would want to put that in the negotiation discussion. You know, so whoever's you doing that. I mean, that's what I would think because again, like if you, if you look at the Jay's situation it was 40 million over three years, we had to go take out a sizable loan to do the project. And then we were getting payments each year, right? Those three years, something like that. Yeah. I mean, there, we didn't were, have that cash on hand, is my point. They were uh, periodic. They weren't yearly. They were... Right. They were at, periodic. As the uh, invoices were submitted. Right. Periodic. But if you've got a new museum, where are they going to come up with that money? You know what I'm saying? So I, I think it has to be a case-by-case -case negotiation situation. Mr. Henderson? I agree. As uh, Mayor Hibbert mentioned before, it could be more expensive if we wait um, as... Mayor Brzezinski said uh, they had to take out a sizable loan, they had to pay interest on that, and that's factored into the whole cost of things, and then it's factored into the amount they're asking from, from the county. So case by case, depending on what it is, how long it's going to take, uh, if it's something that's a one-year deal and they can afford it, then 
we do one lump at the end, but if it's something that's going to be spread out and it's going to take more time to build and they need interim payments as they go, that could be a savings to them and to the county. Okay. Mayor? I'm just concerned about uh, certain organizations that are more startups. Uh, they may, this can be the tipping point between whether they have a project or not. And, you know, with our more established uh, venues, for instance, the aquarium, they had the borrowing power to front all the costs if need be. Uh, but somebody knew, like the Woodson, uh, probably not. And so I think you need to leave the flexibility there. Mm -hmm. If we think the project is worthy of doing in the first place, then it's also worthy of helping finance on the front end rather than the back. Mayor? And I concur with Mayor Hibbert uh, and Mayor Pujowski as well. So is that language in here now? Would you have to add that for uh, that we flexibility? Would clarify if, okay. if it's currently reimbursement only, so we would clarify if that's just allowed by the uh, You've got um, blue, blue lines. When did you change from red line to blue line? I have no okay. idea. Okay. Um, <laughs> you say other than funding for bond debt. So give me an example of that, because that's exclusive. Page is out. Michael. Please. Now, where, where are you but referencing? But if you're, you're going to bond the project, then you obviously are excluded from the From, from the, the reimbursement, right. correct. So what projects have gone that route? Well, I think every project that we've funded the last cycle was all pay-as-you-go, so there were no bonds So issued. we've never done a... Not recently. Okay. Not recently. Okay. That last, I believe, bond issuances were the ones for the raise back in the 80s or whenever that mm -hmm. was, and then the um, um, Phillies and the Blue Jays at one point. That they was also did. bond service, correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Great. Thank you, um, members of the council. Uh, great feedback today on, on this discussion. So. Mr. Chair, if that's all I have on this topic. All right. Are we ready to go back to uh, item five? We are ready to go to item five. And um, this one is uh, industry presentation. And on, on that, I'm going to have um, uh, between our partners at uh, BVK and Miles Partnership to talk about what we're going to be doing in the next um, uh, six months, really through the end of September. Um, before that, um, and, and I know she's sitting silently in the back, but um, I want to make sure you all recognize that Katie Bridges is back with us after her uh, maternity leave, and we're excited to have her back. And uh, so she's, um, um, she entrusted the process to me. BBK is still going through counseling after all this. Um, but, uh, but no, they, uh, we're excited to have Katie back, um, and, and, and leading our efforts, especially with our BVK team. And then Eddie is back there as well, um, who interacts with our, our miles partnership team. So is Carmen going first or yep. All right. Yeah. Carmen Boyce with BVK. Might need to turn that microphone on at the stand. Is it? Is it there okay? you go. Okay, there we go. All right, awesome. Good morning. Thank you. Good to see you all again. Um, I'm going to go through the first set of these slides fairly quickly to get to some of the new stuff at the end. Um, I put a couple slides up here at the beginning just to kind of remind us of our conversation back in September. Um, everything that we did for the first six months followed our annual plan of marketing objectives and goals and strategies, and we are continuing to follow those. So I'm going to present the back half of the fiscal year today. But these were our objectives as we started, um, started our year, obviously driving visitation, wanted people to stay longer, spend more, build our awareness, and obviously we want to serve all of our wonderful partners here in the destination. So as we started looking at our plan and what we wanted to do, one of the key things we wanted to do is have continuity with our core media plan. I'm not going to go into great detail, but we are continuing a lot of the things that we started at the beginning of the year. We also looked at our current travel trends. I know Dave with Destination Analyst was here last month and shared a lot of that information with you. 
And that's obviously something that we've been monitoring closely as we moved into our planning process. One of which, of course, is right now um, people want to travel. People are ready. There's a lot of pent-up demand. We're benefiting from it. It's wonderful. Um, but we also want to keep that going and stay, um, you know, stay top of mind with all these folks. We've also been looking at, obviously, our trends, which we um, and our lovely destination are doing well with our pacing right now. And then the last thing as we were looking at our considerations is we looked at the brand um, research. Again, Dave, I know shared some of that with you last month. We wanted to look at that to look at how can we tell a deeper story about our destination. People know we have these lovely beaches and we're never going to not talk about our beaches. But we also want to broaden our conversation to let people know what a vibrant destination we are and all the lovely things that we have to offer. So we're looking for unique opportunities to do that. Again, real, real quick, our planning considerations are our markets, our audiences, and timing. We have our developmental markets, which is, are the markets that are out of state. We're continuing into those. Obviously, continue with our maintenance markets, which are key markets in state. Our audience remains the same, adults 25 to 65, with a household income of 100K plus. And now this plan is taking us from April through September. This is our marketing channel breakdown. And it just kind of gives you an idea of where we're spending with each of our media channels. Um, the big blue here is, uh, is broadcast and cable within TV and radio. Out of home is the orange. Um, within that, we also have print, which is the, um, the yellow. We have a lot of other, and that includes a lot of our sponsorships that we're doing, sports sponsorships and so forth. Um, and then all the other little pieces, there are all of our different, different digital components with SEM, digital display, longer form, digital TV, and search. So to the core media plan. So we're continuing with our broadcast media. We're going to pick that up in July and run through September. Again, in our same developmental markets that we just talked about. Radio will be running in our developmental and our maintenance markets. Um, and new, you're going to see some promotional extensions I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. Out of home, we're going to be running that May through September. This is a great um, vehicle for saying cost effective, getting a lot of eyeballs to see about our lovely destination. We're running this in our developmental maintenance markets. And something new to the plan this year is our billboard do domination. So we're going to have key locations where instead of just running one message, and then you'll see an, a, a change up and a different message hit the board from, a, from a, another advertiser, we will have consecutive messaging. So we will have four or five boards all in a row. Obviously, this won't necessarily be on a board that's on the side of a highway because if someone drives by, they wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity. We'll have these in key locations where people will be in front of a board long enough to see that whole sequence of messaging to tell a, a broader story about us. Print medium. Uh, print media is a really strong vehicle for us. Our audience indexes very highly with, uh, with print. You know, anything over 100 is great. And with these, many of these titles go up to 135, 140 index with our readers. So we love being in print. It's also one of the big influencers for inspiration for travel. So again, um, we, we select these, handpick these to make sure they're in the right place with our audience. New to the plan this year is Midwest Living and Southern Living and a new half page spread. The half page spread basically runs across two pages like full page spreads, but it's the cost of a single. And the beauty of it is it gives us that lovely presentation and dominance when you open the magazine. But also it eliminates us where we're not going to be against other advertisers. It's all ad with all editorial above it. So it's a really efficient way of, of having a more prominent placement. And we're going to have those in um, our in Garden and Gun and in our uh, city lifestyle publications. Arts is a priority for us, obviously, um, and our arts enthusiasts read both national arts and culture publications. They really look to these um, as, for enjoyment as well as their high readers of the City Lifestyle magazines. So we'll continue our arts messaging in both of these types of publications. And again, in our, in our uh, City Lifestyle magazines, we'll introduce that half page spread. A couple other areas that are very important to us are, are our niche audiences. So we will continue to run in Passport for LGBTQ. 
Plus, as well as rolling out in Chicago and Atlanta um, for a black audience. So that was a, a, just a, a super fast speed just to give you kind of the core elements of our plan. Now to go through some of our overlays and extensions. We're really excited about these opportunities that are our TV promotional extensions in Indy, Orlando, and Atlanta. We're going to have long-form opportunities to really talk about everything that our, our destination has to offer. We're going to have two to three minute vignettes or interviews. We'll be able to show B-roll. We can uh, also include uh, many of our industry partners to highlight their businesses and what makes us truly unique experience here in um, St. Pete Clearwater. Um, we'll be able to do takeovers on one of our stations. We'll actually, every time there's a news, um, news running throughout the day, we will have our placement in there. We'll have sweepstakes, online inclusions, and lots of promotion of these actual extensions. So it's a great way to tap into a loyal audience for these viewers and tell our story. <clears throat> Another opportunity that we're going to be doing as an extension is in Nashville. We'll be sponsoring the weekend weather. So as people are looking for something to do on the weekend, we're going to talk about how lovely it is here in our lovely destination and have um, wonderful integrated messaging into their newscast. Another big um, promotional extension this year, and this is a first for um, working with iHeart Media Group, we're going to be doing 13-minute podlets. And what's beautiful about these is that these aren't just podcasts that we're just producing and then distributing um, you know, on, on iHeart. But these are actually going to be able to tie in to people within iHeart um, uh, influencers, so DJs and personalities, based on their interests and, and unique experiences in our destination. So for instance, if we have an influencer that's a big fisherman, we'll hook them up with Dylan over at Hubbard's Marine and have them interview Dylan for a 13-minute podlet about all the fishing here in this destination. What's beautiful about that is it taps into that influencer's loyal listenership and tells a story that we know is important to to him and that they enjoy listening to. But it also gives an opportunity for us to highlight things in a really, truly unique way by tapping into our own subject matter experts. So these will run as 13-minute podlets and they'll be available on the app library with iHeart. They'll be available through our, our website on social channels, streaming audio. They'll also be edited down and run on uh, broadcast radio stations. Um, they'll also run on the influencers' social channels as well. So I have a lot of distribution of telling this deeper story. Another new opportunity for this, this media plan is um, working with Ryan Gorman on WFLA. This will be running here locally, and it will be an opportunity for us to run a five-minute segment, one each month, focusing on the business of tourism. So we can bring to that conversation members within the community, partners in the community that can help tell that story of imp how important uh, travel and tourism is uh, to our residents and to all of our stakeholders throughout the destination. Um, but uh, again, a really great way to be able to reach our audience through that, uh, through that program. Next, again, another new for this media plan is, we're, uh, is doing a promotional extension with Tourism Talk Florida. I'm sure you're all familiar with this program. It's a highly, highly popular public affairs show that's the Florida Roundtable. We'll have a monthly program on there that's 10 minutes, and it will be an inter interview where we can, again, we can bring stakeholders in. We can bring in economic development. We can bring in a lot of different people to talk about, again, the story of tourism and everything that we have going on. We can talk about events. We can talk about uh, value. We can talk about economics. A lot of different things that, again, give us a great platform of telling a longer story. Influencer, uh, our influencer programs, we've seen a lot of success with these and we're very excited about bringing two new programs, one this spring. And this one, the, the one for the spring um, is ex especially exciting because we'll be going into niche audiences and this will give us a wonderful, authentic way to reach our LGBTQ and Hispanic audiences. We'll be partnering with influencers in these niches in our key developmental markets and it will give them you know they'll come and they'll talk about things including the beach and all the things beyond the beach 
as influencers do. They'll be posting all of that, recapping about it, and we'll get all the assets that they produce as well. For the fall, we're going to change it up a little bit. We're going to talk to an up-and-coming um, influencer in the state as we want to you know, encourage travel to St. Pete Clearwater uh, during the fall. But we're going to also have them promote a sweepstakes to other influencers. And whoever wins the sweepstakes will come into the market and they will post and talk about all of their experiences here in the destination as well and encourage travel during the fall. Of course, some things that really will be exciting are experiential opportunities. Um, we love promoting arts. We know this is a big priority for us. So this fall, we're planning to go into a couple of our key, um, our key markets and uh, have an artist paint murals in, in particularly highly trafficked areas. And, and then we will also do an augmented reality overlay. So that as viewers come up and see the art, not only can they enjoy the art and learn more about our destination, but have an opportunity to really experience it and, and um, get engaged in a way you know, that's truly unique. It also gives us a great platform for reaching out to media and host them to talk more about our arts uh, scene here in St. Pete Clearwater. Additionally, we'll be doing some more activations. Um, we had some great success with Zoo Lights, uh, which you guys are familiar with. We also had a wonderful experience in Nashville with the um, stadium series uh, during Winter Park uh, just a couple weeks ago. So we want to continue, continue that, that uh, momentum that we've got, and we want to support um, the arts again through the Atlanta Arts Festival, great market for us. Uh, in August, they do have um, one of the largest arts festivals in the Southeast. We want to be there with a booth, as well as looking at an interactive overlay with a local artist. And then, of course, sports. We'd be remiss to not mention sports. We're doing activations with the uh, Philly Union uh, during their Pride Night on June 26th. Which brings me to Vigil. Good morning. So just a, a couple of headlines <clears throat> to go through. It's, it's been a really solid year. And in 2021, some pretty impressive statistics with respect to just traffic. 2.2 million new site visits Compare or more site visits compared to 2020, and even going back to a pre-pandemic, 1 million more versus 2019 for a 21% increase. Uh, digital's been performing real solid, and visitors to the new visitstpclearwater.com website are looking at more pages. They're more engaged. They are doing the things that you want them to do. A lot of that comes from content, from site design, but a good portion of that traffic also is media. And so we're finding highly engaged folks that are interacting with your content, learning about the destination, discovering, and ultimately booking. We see that in the fact that about half of the growth last year really came through organic and direct channels. And in addition, the communities and partners, vitally important components of who we're trying to market to, have also seen some really solid performance with page views of all of the community uh, content on the website up 142% for the six months after site launch to the prior period, as well as deals, partner views, looking at their content and the businesses throughout Pinellas County. We're seeing that up 505% uh, versus 20 and 545% versus 2019. So real solid improvement and growth within the performance. I think for 2022, when we look at the strategic objective, we, we, we want to make sure we're leaning in. Uh, a lot of our research is telling us, for example, that Florida is top, top market. Uh, the interest is really, really starting to peak. And as we start heading into our spring and summer campaigns, we want to make sure that we have a strong share of voice within Florida to promote this destination and really encourage consideration. Building awareness of all there is to do, to see, and everything else also re really means that we've got diverse audiences that we want to talk to. And so we're supporting that in a lot of ways through brand alliances. 
bringing followers of strong brands in arts and cultures and other markets to our uh, marketing program to make sure that there's good continuity there. Um, in addition, because of that burgeoning art scene within the destination, we're spending a lot of time in doing things with additional media that really showcases what's going on. And finally, since weekends have been so strong in the data that we're looking at, we're looking at campaigns to help drive some midweek traffic and make sure that we're promoting longer stays. So the plan right now, there's kind of two components. There's always on. There are certain things that you just always need to be doing. 30% of our plan is awareness, 40% in consideration, 30% activation. So we're following them all the way through the funnel in making sure that they know all of the things to see and do, make sure that we have strong consideration versus other destinations, and then finally in activation, booking, making sure that they take action. From the markets, we've got a 50% split into the drive markets, 50% into the fly markets, and between both agencies, we're completely aligned on that target audience of 25 to 65 year olds, 100 plus uh, household income, and certain segments that we really kind of lean into are primary areas of interest, the beach, outdoors, arts enthusiasts, as well as some niche markets like LGBTQ and Latinx. So the kind of the, the foundation of Always On is what you would expect. We're in Google, we're in YouTube, we're in the social media channels. There's also the digital display components that you would typically see at primary publishers, as well as more interactive things, new ways that digital media allows people to not just see an ad, but interact with it, to get to content that interests them, to find the things that they want to do, get more information, as well as seeing, hearing, and understanding everything in the destination. These are renewals of what we've done uh, with Hulu, Nativo, Undertone, Adgenuity. We're crossing a variety of different video, as well as articles, content that's living aside and adjacent to content that's aligned to make sure that there's great engagement. Undertone is one of the folks that we work with that does very cool interactive types of digital ads that allow people to click, play with, explore, and discover different aspects of the destination in a single digital ad unit. So very exciting, high-tech kind of way of promoting the destination and engaging with different audiences. And finally, Adgenuity is our primary display uh, partner that we use for premium inventory, as well as partnering with TripAdvisor to, again, engage with top audiences. On CTV for Hulu, little wrinkle, uh, we did a nice, fun kind of uh, interactive unit before that told a little bit more from a storytelling. We're switching over to a much more video forward type of integration. So if you're sitting at home and you're watching your television, you'll see a video that comes up as well as having the opportunity to click into other videos that talk to other aspects of the destination and allow you to really see what's of interest to you. Custom content comes through our partner Nativo and one of the things that's so powerful about native advertising and if, you, if you're not familiar with native, native is where when you're doing and creating an advertising unit it looks and it has contextual alignment with what is the, the publication that you're participating in. So for example, if you're putting an a, 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 a content piece, really an advertisement, into the Smithsonian.com or into AtlasObscura.com, the ad text and the story is aligned with what you're seeing and reading about that's already of interest to you. And because they're aligned, you've got really solid targeting and very, very high engagement. They work together, and they work together very effectively. And a lot of times, too, even though you're in what's an ad unit, because it's at Forbes.com, Smithsonian.com, you're still staying within their formatting and their look and feel. So it doesn't even really look like an ad in most cases. That's one of the reasons why we see the engagement so high. 
Undertone, as I mentioned, does, this is a good example of that interactivity. It's an ad unit that allows you to explore what's in interest to you. And because it's interactive, it's fun. It's something that you can play with, enjoy, and see content in a way that's engaging. We've got some premium sites that we're working with. TripAdvisor has what's called the Navigator platform that allows you to really target in on destination. So you're finding folks that are looking for the destinations that have a history in browsing of similar content as well as a search history that indicates that they're going to be a perfect target for you to communicate all of the wonderful things here in, in Pinellas County. In addition, Connast Publications has a collection. You can see some of the great publications here, uh, Travel and Leisure, uh, Connast Traveler, uh, Vanity Fair, Vogue. These are the type of high upper income lifestyle publications that are perfect placements for a lot of the advertising that we're promoting. And for, for summer, spring and summer of, of 22, we've got some new things that we're doing. We want to make sure that we're getting in and leaning into more podcasts and audio. We've got some new brand partnerships rolling out. Long form content, again, those native ads that are storytelling ads, again, I think are very important in, in helping us convey the multidimensionality of the destination and being able to go a little bit more in depth in explaining why visiting Pinellas County, St. Pete Clearwater is such a great choice for folks as well as some custom co-op opportunities that allow us to really engage with the partners. So Spotify, podcasts. Uh, podcasts, as you know, are extremely popular. We've seen a tremendous surge in the amount of folks that are downloading podcasts. It's an important platform. You can't just be in one media. A lot of times you need to really diversify. So podcasts are an important part of that whole component and it's a network that reaches over 3.2 million um, with 100 plus uh, 1,000 original and exclusive content that allow us to introduce the destination in, an, in a very nice way and engage with audiences from this medium. In addition from just streaming, uh, we'll be working with Spotify as well in reaching 87 million audience, targeting very carefully, making sure we're aligned with content in addition to going in and doing some targeting within the LGBTQ and Latinx markets as well. Custom content in Culture Trip was a unique opportunity that was exciting for us and a real new opportunity in that Culture Trip kind of does a nice job of looking at different kinds of content within a specific ad unit. So for example, when partnering with them, we're enabled to do the storytelling, the social interaction, a variety of different ways to make sure that we're effectively engaging with audiences. It's custom social video with a kind of a user-generated content or UGC feel. It looks authentic, it feels authentic, and again, kind of distance you a little bit from an advertising unit and more allows you to truly engage. Uh, in, a, in addition, there will be two articles that are created, some high-impact display, as well as social amplification, promoting through the 8.5 million US followers within the Culture Trip audience. Uh, new partner is Smithsonian. So certainly for the arts and culture enthusiasts, Smithsonian is a well-recognized brand. Pairing with brands that have that value brings value to the destination. It's kind of a transference of the loyalty, the excitement, the dedication of the Smithsonian audience to the extremely unique arts and culture offerings here in the destination. And that transference of brand identity is a big part of Atlas Obscura, the New York Times, a lot of the things that we're doing when we're looking at custom content with brand partners. Travel Zoo, not a new name, but they've got some new products this year in that they're doing two different kinds of ways. One is a destination showcase. So much like what you're seeing here for Arizona, for San Diego, you're taking the best of the best, curating articles, images, and other content to help folks really understand the destination better, dial into things of interest, and be able to engage at a, at a real high consideration and awareness level 
on beaches, arts and culture, and craft beer. In addition, with Travel Zoo, there's another component that's new, which is really the, the Partners Showcase. That allows us to pair the destination content with partner travel offers. It's again a little lower in the funnel now, so that we're getting into the booking, making sure that they're taking action, driving to partners to create value for them. Expedia, another well-known brand in the industry. Expedia has excellent co-op programs. And a lot of what we see is when bringing VSPC together with partners through distribution channels like Expedia, is that we get very good participation in driving the bookings and creating that economic activity and making sure that we're doing well in terms of occupancy, bed tax, and all of the other desirable economic impact. Two areas of that would be the co-op program that allows partners to buy in um, multiple investment levels based on their marketing budget, so it's scalable for a variety of different businesses. And in addition, we'll be using banner and net native ads to drive to custom landing pages that target travelers searching for St. Petersburg Clearwater and comp against competing destinations. And then one other component that's new is, is driving along the longer stays. So one of the things, again, is that we wanted to say that there's so much here in this destination to see, you can't just do it in two or three days. You need to plan a longer stay. So a lot of the visuals and the messaging within the campaign are focused on making sure that folks understand that it's kind of a fear of missing out. That if you don't book a four, five, six, seven night vacation, you're not gonna be able to see and do all that there is here in the destination. So that's digital. Uh, I don't know if, Carmen, do we want to just go through on the media rec recommendations? Was there anything or budgeting that we wanted to cover? Or is... no, well, good. Thank you very much. <clears throat> sure. When you were uh, talking about TripAdvisor, how are you reaching out? Are you serving up ads? Are you working with TripAdvisor to, to be able to follow those people and serve ads? Is that what you're doing? Or? Expedia t typically allows us to do tracking. They're kind of a, they're our customer. Um, we'll get the booking performance data and everything else, but what we do is work within Expedia to do specific targeting by interest, by demographic, by all of the other parameters that are part of the advertising buy. So we're very specific at how we target and promote within the Expedia network. And then there are other pathways through Expedia to get to the content. They're actually funneling you through to the consumers we're looking for. With direction from our team and the media planners is how they figure out the buy and the targeting and who we want to speak to. Because there's different kinds of content in Expedia too, a lot of what Expedia knows about their guests helps us to be able to understand their interests, their <coughs> travel propensity, how many trips they typically travel per year a tremendous amount of data that allows us to get very specific to say, you travel a lot, you like beaches, you do this, you do that, you're going to see it versus somebody else who may not have those specific interests. Further questions? Yes, sir. Um, Scott, how do we look at the slide you had up there of uh, trending, it showed trending markets, and, and I'm sitting here thinking about the trending markets, are we spending enough time, and how do we measure it from what you have on this measurement? And then more, maybe I want to say old markets that haven't come back in the last two years because of the pandemic completely, but, you know, they're sitting out there. Can we get those sources, and how do we evaluate to come back to, to Scott and say, or to staff and say, you know, we're starting to move over here a little bit more. We're seeing where we are. And the third part is, do we measure rates at all? Rate increases are moving very high. And how, what happens in those evaluations when you look at digital versus that? At a very high level, yeah. I will say Visit St. Pete Clearwater probably has better access to data than most of the DMOs that Miles Partnership works with. And there are sources like Adara. There are the advertising network sources. There's Google Analytics sources. There's destination analyst data. There's STR data. There is home rental industry data. All of those data sources really come together to allow us to see where the trending markets are. It was about, <coughs> excuse me, two, two and a half years ago, 
Texas started a trend. And we started to see Toronto and some other things. Some of that was site traffic, some of that was Adara data. And Adara is a pretty unusual data source. What Adara does is it allows us for all of our digital ads to put a little pixel in there that says, I want to know when somebody looks at this ad. Adara then takes that and understands that person because they have access to United Airlines, Hilton Hotels, and about 100 other data partners that share the data with Adara. Adara knows that somebody that saw our ad stayed at a Hilton, flew on United, and did other activity on their credit card from data coming from Visa. All of that data, because we understand very specifically that that little pixel linkages to that specific person and we get their actual spending data, we're able to say that ad resulted in a visit, resulted in so much economic activity, this is where they're from, and this is where we're advertising, and we want to match up where we're advertising where we're with where people are spending and where people are coming from and what people are doing when they're actually in the destination. All of that together, you layer in STR, you layer in Google Analytics, you layer in the other data, and collectively that informs the strategy of what we're doing. Each month, we go through and look at the performance of how many clicks are we getting in this market, in Indianapolis versus Chicago, in Dallas versus Toronto. How much spend? What's the actual efficiency of what we spend in that market to how much we drive in economic activity from Adara, from site visits on the website, to stays in our hotels from the STR occupancy, ADR, and RevPAR data. All of that collectively together is the giant mess that Kayla and other folks that are on the Miles Media Planning team are weeding through to develop strategy. And it, it requires constant calibration. Hope that answers your question. If I could ask though, should we be asking now a little more detail from you on a report on new markets that are trending or whatever it is and, and give us a little update in looking at that way because as a hotel and all, you're taking care of it for us, but we're also working other programs also that we'd like to know should we be staying in that market or not or is it more traditional? I, I, we welcome that. I think that's always smart and we do a good job of working with the VSPC team. We're always, always excited to hear from partners within the marketplace to share, to collaborate, to learn. Uh, I absolutely think that there's opportunity to increase what happens on partner communications to make sure that we're co collectively working together and so that you have the information, okay, this is getting hammered pretty well in traditional media through the standard buys. I might want to supplement a little bit in some of my unique markets that perform well for me, because everybody's a little bit different, their followings, and so a lot of times I think when you can look at that in a really holistic kind of fashion, you're gonna be more effective, both on your side and our side, so absolutely welcome that. I think we should, be. for example, with, with, my, with our hotel, we've put a lot more emphasis in Nashville, than, and, and it's increasing, it's a great market to have, but then I worry about um, Philadelphia or, or I'm where, uh, Pittsburgh, that was a traditional market that's not there on the, on the list at all or it's just barely trending. So that's why I'm asking that question that maybe we should be getting a little bit more information, uh, what's next type of thing. And, and you're absolutely right. Things, Thank you. Thing, things move. T Texas was popping in the pandemic, I think when air service was limited to some of the big markets that were international markets like Cancun, uh, that came to Florida. And it's still strong because we leaned in at that time and we're holding on and it's performing very well. Other markets in the pandemic were very interesting. The Northeast fell, the Midwest increased, and there's, there's shifts there. And we're seeing it shift back to its more traditional pattern in that the Northeast is definitely heating up compared to where the Midwest was two years ago. And so those are the kinds of things where hopefully uh, together, I think we have a better understanding of how those shifts are changing, what's <clears throat> realizing the true arrivals into the destination and how better to market, tap in, 
and make sure that we're stimulating as much as we can. You summed it up. Uh, Thank you. Ms. Moore, did you have something? Yes, I think um, directing more to Steve, um, it, it related to what we've heard from Miles and from BVK as it relates to arts and culture. How is VSPC interfacing and utilizing Creative Pinellas in this regard to, are you all working together? Uh, give me some feedback on, on how that's, that's doing because I, I'm, I'm wouldn't think that you're reinventing the wheel in terms of your, your arts and culture marketing, so. And a great question on that. And actually, uh, I think, as you probably know, working with Creative Pinellas, um, for us, I wanna be, uh, have it a symbol, uh, symbiotic relationship. So like one of the things that I've talked to Barbara about is, you know, if we're gonna be out taking a message, let's say to the Atlanta market, and you get Atlanta visitors in here, what can she be doing to help let the visitors in the market know these are the great things that are going on, whether it be an event, a venue, exhibits, what all the, all the various things are. So I think um, that's one aspect of that. Uh, the other element is working with other uh, major institutions um, and entities to make sure that sharing with them what we're doing, because again, a lot of this is brand new in terms of the push that we have, whether it be through the, the media, the creative, any of that. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're out there hitting the right things. Cause again, it's a different audience than what you would have that would normally go to the beach. Um, doesn't mean they're not going to go there, but you know, they're gonna have more of that relationship in visiting, a, a, let's say a museum or going for a performance or something along that line. And then they'll take in the beach as the secondary um, option. So I know that both <clears throat> marketing partners have also looked at specific data related to that visitor and then built plans around that data. Because I'm not hearing Creative Pinellas mentioned and I, I wouldn't think that Miles or BBK necessarily would be interfacing with them as the county's art council, so to speak, um, I, I would think that would be your role mm -hmm. to, to kind of help facilitate that and make sure that the resources that Creative Pinellas has and their um, relationships with all of the different artists and, and facilities that we have throughout the county so that, that that gets focused. So I appreciate that. And then the other part, uh, you and I've had ongoing conversations um, about the vacation rental data. And I'm still not clear on where we are with that to help identify, you know, what sources are, are we using and how can we flesh that out? Because my comments and discussion with Steve have been that um, not all of the companies who do these vacation rentals, not all of the resorts that are our vacation res resort type uh, properties are, their information is not necessarily being filtered in. And, and Steve and I have had ongoing conversations. So if you can update us. Um, and actually on that, Jeffrey's had a conversation with Key Data. Um, he's actually on his honeymoon. And so I didn't get a report back from him to hear what the conversation was. but. Uh, really what, what Doreen's referring to, and it's like this with Smith Travel, um, it, you only have so much data that you don't, you're not gonna have 100% participation, but yet you don't want 20% participation. So you wanna get a bigger slice of the data by having more people participate. So we wanna ensure that we're getting a higher particip participation rate from the, the property management company so that the data we have is more true to what, what's being out there. Right now on Smith, it's roughly about 78% for STR on the hotel side. So if I can get 75%, 70% on the vacation rental, I'm good. And I think right now we're probably about 40 to 50%. I'm guessing. And I'm uh, reluctant to agree with those numbers. So um, I know it's something that's a work in progress. And I think it's very important because 
as, as you know, the tourism arm and the, the sales tax collection, bed tax collections, um, you know, as we've seen with the reports, recognizing as it's changed over the years, the importance of the vacation rental site. And that if we don't have accurate numbers um, or a, a healthy representation, um, it's not really benefiting us overall, you know, when you, when you have such a small uh, reflection. So I appreciate your efforts on that and, and look forward to being kept up to date. Thanks. Thank you. Mayor? I agree with Doreen wholeheartedly on the vacation rentals. Um, we need to have more detailed and more of that information um, because I think it, it informs all kinds of things. I mean, beyond what we're even thinking, you know, business investment. Um, so anyway, that wasn't why I raised my hand. Um, I don't know who would want to answer this question, but in the presentation we just saw, one of the things we saw was that we have about a 50% drive market and a 50% fly market. And that seems um, a little different than what we've experienced before. I'm just curious as how does it compare to the last quarter or the last six months previous? Does anybody know that? And, and you can certainly get back to us or shoot, shoot us an email. I, I would just like to understand how that ranks. Is it different? It feels like it's different. It does change. Uh, one of the things that we saw was a real strong recurrence during the pandemic outbreak in drive. Right. And so we shifted to that. Typically the fly market is a very good guess from the standpoint of longer stay, hotel stay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have a little bit more of a share within the drive market to stay with friends and relatives, other kinds of things. Um, and all of that is something that we look at to really hit the optimal mix with the way that we're targeting, the way that we're marketing, and the economic value. With a lot of this data and statistics that we get, we look at efficiency, and from the ADARA data, we layer that again against how much economic value the different markets provide. And so when you're figuring out mixes in media, there's a variety of different types of media that we're using that allow us to find an optimal mix. When you're looking at SCM, for example, you're really broad brush hitting across all of the different destinations. When you're looking at other types of media, you're looking at specific markets where you want to kind of come in with a set buy. What we found is as that shifts and as we look at the different trends, we adjust that appropriately. 50-50 was from the media planning and analytics department just the right mix for where we are given all of the propensities that we're seeing for how many people are flying, how many people are traveling, and how much economic value. So on your presentation, what I, what I thought, and I could have been mistaken, so feel free to tell me I'm wrong. Everybody else does. Um, <laughs> what I thought it was telling us was that was the trend, was the 50% drive and 50% fly. But what I'm hearing... Target. What I'm hearing is that's how you're advertising. It's how we target gotcha. the allocation. Okay, mix. so that's that's Correct. different. Um, okay. And, and the other thing is winter, we tend to see fly increase. Right, because so, it's cold. So you'll see some right. uh, diff different values there sure. in our uh, winter campaign than summer. Okay, and then the other question I had, and again, I it, it may be you, Steve. Um, it, it was late last summer, and I don't remember exactly when we got a, a whole very large um, presentation on what our marketing plan was for the next six months. And what I'd like to, and, and we talked about some new markets. I think it was Indiana, I think it was Chicago, it might have been Nashville, I don't remember them all. It was a few, plus the arts. Um, I'd like to know how, how we've done in those markets, like a comparison now. We've done it, how's it, how's it working? Is that, and again, if you can't answer that question today, that's totally fine. But I, I kind of thought that's what today was going to be, and I don't think I, I either missed it or I didn't glean that from today. 
Yeah, more for today was to talk about the What's next, next the next six yeah. months. Because again, I think in the past you've had presentations where in October we or September we've presented and said, "Here's what we're going to do for the next year." Yeah. And and and, and you're whittling it down in smaller chunks. I see that it, exactly because there might be some changes. There's changes that are being have been done both through BBK and Miles where we didn't do that in the first six months, but we introduced it in the second six months. Yeah. Um, but I just think it's helpful to know how you did in that six, since we are doing it in smaller chunks, to see how we've been trending at least. You might not have the whole six month information, but to see how you're trending, to understand, you know, what's next. Yeah, and I... I mean, and again, you can just bring it back some yeah. other time. Well, I, and Mayor, I, what I was going to say is, um, Carmen and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't we doing an, uh, another ad effectiveness? So that'll be on that portion. Uh, so we presented that um, ad effectiveness on the six months prior to that. Okay. So this one will be the next version, and this gotcha. is what we plan on doing each, you know, okay. each two two times a year. Thank you. Yeah, I was, was going to say the ad tracker will help answer some of that, and it showed our last one that we did was showing how we were progressing in those those markets, and so we will compare exactly. You know, we'll have this will be like our second one that we'll have numbers to compare against. From one of the Mayor Hibbard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to belabor this. I wanted to just hear a little bit more about the stats that Doreen wants, because we are seeing a lot more vacation rental in our T district, which is where we still allow it. We've got a lot of new product coming on. Where's the T district? It's our tourist district. Oh, gotcha. uh, in our ordinance, we don't allow short-term rentals in the residential area on North Beach. But in the T district, 23 that are grandfathered in. Uh, everything south of the Acacia Circle, though, to the Sand Key Bridge is our T district. And we have a new condo hotel that's all three twos. And we have a new project that's coming on. We've got these units that are eight bedrooms oh my God. and six bath with their own individual pools. Oh my but they're attached dwellings. Wow. Uh, and we're trying to anticipate what the impact of those are gonna be. A lot of cars. A lot of people. But what are some of the statistics that you're hoping to get? Because I'm curious. Well, it's just, yeah. like, Your microphone, please. It's like the STAR report. You know, you only have the statistics on ROI and, and you know, the, the occupancy numbers and all those things related to the people who are reporting into the system. And my concern has been that I don't necessarily think that, that key data is, is getting all of these property management companies. And, um, in order to do that, it's it's like the hotels with a star report, you have to pay for it. So I'm not seeing, for me personally, I'm not necessarily reporting to key data um, simply because I wasn't seeing the benefit of the amount of money that it was gonna cost me to be in their reporting. I'm reversing that in that we as an agency need those numbers and I don't care, you know, I don't need to know what my competitor's doing. It's like the hoteliers. It needs to be funneled into some source that give us the actual occupancy numbers and the dollars and the, the tax collection and all those things to see the impact overall because the condo hotels are being added. And those are being how how are those being reported and so those that it's just, it's the same information as the star report but we have to find a way to to maximize on those numbers and the way we were doing it in prior years many years ago prior research company um sent out a fax and you filled out numbers and and it went back in to the research company and you know even that wasn't entirely accurate because it was kind of randomly this month they spoke to this person and that month they spoke to someone else and they're 
with technology, we need to find a way to be able to assimilate those numbers without it having to be driven on how many rooms I have, so how much is it going to cost me to be in the report? That answer, yeah, it's um, having been around the block a few times in this, the, the old days of the facts and getting the information is one way that now that you can do it, you look at everything online, but then it depends on whose system talks to whose system and all the things that they go with it. So we always try to find a way to improve And What we're looking at is how do we get those that are currently not involved involved in a way that gives us better um, uh, sample size and participation. Um, and then and I, I think what might be good is to go through and actually do a report just on key data so you can see the types of information we do get and what we don't get. So it, you know, kind of, in, in for the body as a whole, you, you go through it and, and look at that. And one other point to that is, is that because you've got individual condo hotels managed by different companies, is maybe educating us, the vacation rental industry, as to why we should be reporting. And maybe there's a benefit that I'm missing that you know somebody's going to have to contact each one of these resorts and and through VSPC make them aware of why it's important and how it can help everyone overall. So there's an education component there too. Thank you. I, I would just add it would be great to have that information by city and be able to compare that against hotels. I, I was going to adjourn, but Mayor Welch has something. Yeah, no pressure there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I just wanted to agree with the other part of Ms. Moore's statement about the arts. As we move forward, I really like to understand how we get input from the arts community, what Creative Pinellas' role and the other arts alliances around uh, the county is, both in formulating the marketing but also in measuring the impact. I've heard an awful lot of this uh, during the campaign last year, and as you know, there were a couple of forums and debates where this issue came up. So I'd like to understand as we talk about strategic planning. That was less than a minute, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right. Th thank you, Mr. Bacon and um, Ms. Boyce. We appreciate your presentation today. So I guess I get to do cleanup here at the end. <laughs> so I, I will go through this uh, very quickly. Hopefully they'll bring the slides up. Um, I was just kidding about it, Jeremy. I was just wanting to oh. give the mayor a hard time. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I, but um, All right, first thing I want to go over, because we did talk about TDD collections earlier. Uh, this is for the month of Janu uh, January. Um, 7.4 million was collected, which was up 75% over 2021 and 31% over 2019. Year to date, we're at 25 million compared to 14. Million in fiscal year 21. The graph really says it all. So if you look at the line uh, that has the blue dots and black line, that is 2022. The yellow circles with the dashed black line is 21. So you can see where we are above that. And we're above 19 and we're above 20. So um, bottom line, and, and I feel for Jim because, you know, when he was. You know, when we had the conversation of trying to forecast where we were going to be, I, I never would have picked this scenario. Um, and again, when we look at it and go to the next slide, um, when you go, yeah, well, the reverse of it would be if it was going down, you know, what, what ends up happening. But I think this, this slide, when you look at the, the hotel occupancy, uh, again, this is for January, you look at 2022, we were at 61% overall compared to 51% in 21. And basically, at this point in time, we're going to stop using 19 because 21 is going to stand on its own actually after this month um, because you really saw, I mean, huge spikes in business in, for 21 starting in, in March of last year. So you can see where we were up. Uh, in occupancy, but then look at the rate difference. So that's driving, you know, driving that increase in um, 
the TDT. When you get down to um, vacation rental, there's the data related to that for the month of January. And then um, also down at the bottom, what the occupancy in ADR was at the beach, but also in inland. And again, as a reminder, uh, beach is anything west of the intercoastal, um, inland is anything east of the uh, uh, intercoastal. Let me go to the next slide. All right, this is something I did want to show because there was a there was a, um, a report out earlier where they were talking about how Tampa and Miami were leading the recovery in 21 in the state. And, and what I wanted to do was go through and look, and this is just on Smith Traveler, STR data. And so when you look at the top 25 markets, MSAs, in the United States that STR looks at on a monthly basis, the Tampa market, which it says Tampa, really is Tampa St. Pete Clearwater. So it is the, it is the region. Um, in calendar year 21, so for 12 months, uh, we ranked first in occupancy. We were fourth in ADR and third in REVPAR, REVPAR being revenue per available room. So now I'm paying attention to that a little bit more closely on a weekly basis, especially as we're in full-blown recovery here. So the week of January 31st, we were third all the way across an occupancy ADR REVPAR. The week of February 20th, um, we were first in occupancy, second in ADR, second in REVPAR. Uh, week of February 27th, third in, in occupancy, second in ADR, second in REVPAR. I just got our weekly data this morning. I looked at it real quick. I just don't have the rest of the U.S., um, but you're looking at last week, the week of March 6th, average occupancy, uh, 83 percent compared to 81 the week prior rate 254 compared to 232 the week prior uh, rev par 210 versus 195 so the numbers continue to go up um, and and how I look at, at it with the the top 25 markets when I look at the Tampa Bay area is I see whether we're below it or above it if we're above it, it means we're bringing the region up. If we're below it, then we might be bringing the region down. Um, but right now, from a competitive set, primarily competing, Miami pretty much, uh, if they're not first, they're second, um, both in, in all of those areas. Um, Oahu uh, will come in in there as well. And then like for the week of January 31st, um, actually LA was ahead of us. And the only reason why it ended up being because it was Super Bowl in LA. So again, just another metric to look at how we're doing. Um, and I, I'm sure that our um, hotel friends will certainly agree based on that, on, on, on that data. Uh, next slide. Uh, graphically, just to look at this, black line represents 2022, blue um, is 21. I'm sorry, 19, and the orange is 21. This is looking at occupancy just at the hotel motel level. And again, you see where we were in between 21 and 19 up until March. And then March last year is when we started to exceed. So we're right at that point uh, uh, this, uh, this year. Uh, next, next page, visitor profile, just some, some key elements. Um, daily spend is up this year. Uh, your party size is pretty much equal. Still a very short decision time period. Um, and this was amplified. We had a meeting recently with Edelweiss uh, talking about the nonstop from Zurich. And, I, and we were meeting with the CEO and I asked the question, I was like, in normal times, what was your booking pattern? And they were looking at four to six months. Um, he said they're looking at four to six weeks right now. So this is even internationally, the booking pattern is, is very short. Um, the percent stayed overnight, increased dramatically um, over 21. Uh, we did see a drop in average income from 118,000 down to 97,000. Again, this is just for January of 22. Um, the last couple things I wanted to go through and mention, um, a, uh, uh, Next month, 
is for our April meeting is our budget meeting. So um, that'll be from nine and we were, we told you to block or hold, hold you block off until two. We will have lunch last year. Uh, we didn't make it all the way to two. We actually were short of that. So I'm sure that the chair is, is out to break that record. Um, but we had really good discussion, so we'll have all that information uh, for discussion uh, next month. I also did want to mention, because, you know, again, we're already looking at May. May 1st through the 8th is National Travel and <clears throat> Tourism Week. Um, <clears throat> and we'll have a number of activities going on that week. Uh, everything from a travel rally at uh, St. Pete Clearwater National Airport. Uh, we're putting together a... Um, informational session uh, looking at probably the future of travel. Uh, we'll be participating in a couple of um, um, events that are taking place. One is the Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber has a, a typical lunch and that'll be on Thursday. In addition, <clears throat> Visit Tampa Bay has their luncheon on Thursday. Um, we are doing a beach cleanup um, on Wednesday, inviting you know, not only of staff but the industry and then on Friday, uh, we will be competing to retain the Pineapple Cup when we take on the folks that visit Tampa Bay in a competition. Last year, we won in shuffleboard, and it won quite heartily. This year, they have chosen bocce ball. So uh, they get to choose who so we're going to go over. We'll be practicing in the office uh, and uh, getting ourselves uh, ready to take on that team. But a great way to interact with our partners ac across the bay. Um, and that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, anything from the board members? Mayor. Is there any way we could start that uh, budget meeting like at 830? I mean, I'd just soon start at 730, but I know not everybody's morning people. Maybe but <laughs> but 830, maybe a half hour early? It will of the board. I'm. I was here this morning much earlier than that. So, eight thirty. Does that work with that. staff, Steve? That, yeah. All right. We'll get. We'll make that. You'll get the calendar changed from Liz. Mr. Prather. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, um, it's dealing with just quick questions on the budget. Um, I'm always amazed, Jim. You and your staff do a fantastic job. Um, with Steve forecasting these numbers. Um, I asked this a couple years ago, so I apologize for asking again. You, we pay the tax collector half a million dollars or so to um, collect our bed tax, and you have that as a line item on page two of the budget you gave us this morning. Uh, you budgeted 600000 which is fine. But on page one, under operating expenses, you have intergovernmental expenses, which obviously is not the tax collector. Can you help me with what some of those might be? Million two. Um, I believe that those are um, BTS charges for the technology, um, full cost allocation, which covers the cost to run the government, the uh, salaries of the commissioners, the salaries of um, OMB, uh, various salaries that support CVB that they don't pay for, they're paid for by general fund dollars. Um, uh, I believe that's the bulk of them. Okay, it was um, just the, this some there. risk charges um, for you know just uh, the risk to the employees, you know, if they travel and things like that. So okay. the, those are the the bulk of it. And um, also, I don't have a staff. I I'm one person. Wow, uh, but amazing. Terry and uh, you know Steve's staff. Put, the, put this report together. I'm actually work for the management and budget office, so uh, I don't want you to think that. I can give you some credit. No, there, there's a, you know, I work with uh, Steve's staff on Thank you. on all this stuff, and this is mainly uh, their their report. Second question for you, Steve. Um, so we we've got budgeted sixty seven million dollars um, for twenty two. Last year we were at north of seventy. And it certainly looks with your graph that we should hopefully exceed even that number. Um, so if we collect, once again, I'll use the budget number of 67, we pay out 
nine million in operating and personnel and 28, um, we'll call that, um, that leaves about $30 million left over each year for um, capital projects. And so of that $30 million, and we do the 60-40 split, we obviously talk so much about museums and what we're gonna spend on the capital. What happens to the surplus um, in the non-capital? It keeps growing and growing, but we, what are we gonna, how are we gonna spend that? We're not gonna spend more than 14 million in advertising, it wouldn't go there, so help me understand how this growing surplus on that side of the ledger is gonna work. Jim, before I answer, is there anything you wanna to add to that? No, I'll, I'll let you answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and this is a discussion that, um, in fact, uh, Jim and I and Terry are meeting on Friday to talk about budget for next year. Okay. And one of the things that I wanna look at is um, if we have a fund balance that's out there, there is a minimum amount in that fund balance that needs to be kept. The county has a policy on that. In addition, I want to I want to go through and identify dollars that could be set aside for what I'm going to call business continuity. Something happens. It could be man-made. It could be uh, weather. It could be pandemic. It, whatever. And we have to go out and and let folks know that we're either open, not open, we've got to generate business, that that money is set aside in there so that we're able to go through and do that. Um, and then in, in, a, in addition to that um, is, you know, again, looking at the um, operations of uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater, and again, from a business continuity standpoint. So like during pandemic, we borrowed money that we repaid back to capital, but we had taken money from there. I'd like to have a, res you know, a, a, a identified in that fund fund balance, and then I think the rest of it that is available. How do we go through and identify maybe specific programs that can be done that would be of priority, um, with you know specific outcomes that we were lo you know looking for. Um, pick whatever that, that particular item might be. So I think it's good to have a healthy savings account, but I also think at some point you've got to, once you've reached that point, is then what's the best way to spend those dollars in a way that will still have a, a, a positive impact back in the community and the industry. And thank you very much for that answer. Right now on the budget, on page two, you show 47 plus million dollars in reserves for operating and $42 million for capital. And we've, once again, we've had enough discussion about the capital. That's not my, my question today. It's the 47, which really is higher than that. And it's going to grow again by the surplus for this year. So it's very prudent that we do keep a reserve. We saw that in the pandemic, you needed five plus million dollars and you had it. Um, but you still got arguably $50 million. So I just, trying to figure out what are we going to do with that $50 million that's going to continue to grow? Well, and, and, and just as that's I explained, that, I mean, that's what I'd like to be able to do. That's the discussion I want to have with the budget office. And then what other parameters go with that? And again, I don't know if other conversations have been had by this body on utilizing those dollars in that way. I don't know if this body, if we've ever had a fund balance that high. So I would propose to the chairman that we do have uh, maybe a line item on the budget, or line item in the, in the agenda to discuss that. This, this fund balance keeps getting higher and higher, and it's meant to promote and market our destination, that, that side of the ledger. Um, we have, what, a million plus dollars we do for, um, for events that we give away, um, or we help sponsor. Once again, it, the fund balance on that side is just getting so high, I think a discussion needs to, and a direction needs to be discussed. What are we going to do? Because every year that's going to get higher and higher. And it's not meant for museums. Um, it's not meant for the things we talked about, which are the exceptions um, that the state gave us um, to spend TDC dollars on. This is just for marketing and advertisement and promotion of our destination. Well, you've got to ask yourself what, how did you get there, too, you know? because that's usually something about budgeting. Mayor Hibber. 
I think it's worth a future discussion. Um, when we're seeing occupancies at the level that they're at, I don't know that we need to be doing additional advertising right now. Uh, I always think we need to be promoting the destination. Having been on this board on and off now for 20 years, unfortunately, there will come a time when we need more dry powder. You know, back when we had the oil spill, we weren't affected directly. We sure needed more money to tell the story that we weren't. You know, when red tide comes, mm -hmm. whenever inevitable things happen in this state, and we are a boom and bust economy, uh, you know, nobody believes it's going to happen again. It will happen again. Uh, so I think we need to keep some reserves that are fairly sizable so that during those times we have the arsenal that we need. Further discussion? Mr. Kimball. Just to add to the mayor's comments is that as we look over that 20 years also, we're in a new time. Our occupancy is still, when you looked at it, is still below 19. We're all rate-driven as where it is today. We're not sure how long this rate-driven is going to stay in place and everything. So I think that he's right on that we need to look at the next ups and downs and everything. But it's an interesting time. It's a new time for us that's different. So discussions are certainly needed as we follow through. Uh, but it's, this is all rate-driven now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and it's always part of that discussion of, you know, how, how much, where do we, you never want to take the foot off the gas because you're always scared of doing that. But uh, what, how much is too much? When do we hit our number of, we can't take any more people? And that, uh, but I, to be honest, I did not realize our operating reserves were as healthy as they were uh, on that. The capital I knew, because um, we hadn't committed to anything recently, but um, it's an interesting discussion that we'll have. And I, I assume that we'll get knee deep in that in our April meeting. Mr. Anderson. I think it's good to have the, <clears throat> the reserves right now. I think we'll find a way to spend it later. Um, what we experienced last year was you couldn't go to Europe, you couldn't go to the Caribbean, you couldn't go on a cruise ship, everybody came to Florida. And we're seeing that continue. But as the cruise ships become popular again, as the Caribbean opens up more, as we work away out of the pandemic, we're gonna have those competitive factors again and we will need to advertise more perhaps. Hopefully, Europeans will come back at the same time and other markets will grow. But uh, having that reserve now is good. I think we'll find in the next couple of years how we can spend it. Oh, we, we, I'm sure that there's some folks on that side of the room that can help us uh, uh, figure out how to spend an extra few million. Or 50. <laughs> or 50. <laughs> Mayor Welch. No, I look forward to the conversation. I think it's a great uh, issue that you've raised and I always appreciate Russ's uh, wisdom on this. Um, one of the issues that we've heard a lot about is a permanent level of support for the arts. So when we get to that uh, discussion, I'd like to talk about that as well. Very good. Thank you. All right, we've had a uh, great discussion today in depth from our partners and uh, I think very productive conversation on our capital. And unless there's anything else for the good of the order, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.